Well, good morning, my, my friends on YouTube. Um, I just want to uh, say welcome in Jesus' name. And, and this morning, um, I will not be delivering the message, but my good friend David Novotny, who is a representative from the Gideons, has uh, graciously volunteered to come and share God's word with us today. And so he's going to be speaking to you about uh, spending time with God. And we hope that this message encourages you, builds you up in your most holy faith, and if you don't, don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, it's real simple. Just ask him into your heart, and he will change you and make you a new creation. And I know Dave would definitely endorse that message, because the Gideons are a group of businessmen all about spreading God's word to the world. And so we want to support them. And so if you have an opportunity, please support the Gideons. And you can uh, make your checks out to the Gideons and send it to whatever local Gideon affiliate you may have in your town or or region. And uh, my name is Pastor Nelson Krabser, and uh, may God bless you. Have a great day. And remember, Jesus loves you. He was 17 years old when he decided to poison himself. It seems inconceivable now that he should have felt such intense shame over less than stellar academic achievement. That suicide, that suicide would present itself as an uncomplicated even honorable way to avoid embarrassment and not bring shame on the family. But there in his hospital room, an encounter with Jesus through John's gospel set in motion a series of events that now, 50 years later, has led him to be one of the world's foremost champions of thoughtful, intellectual, rigor intellectually rigorous Christian faith. In a recent interview, he said, but what happened prior to my coming to Christ is probably more reflective of why I'm in this kind of ministry. I had lots of questions. I had lots of struggles. I was immersed in religion on every side. My ancestors came from the highest caste of the Hindu priesthood. At the age of 17, when I tried to take my own life, on a bed of suicide, someone came into my hospital room with a Bible. And opened it to John chapter 14. To hear the words of Jesus in the 14th chapter of John talking to Thomas, not just saying, I am the way, the truth, and the life, but going on to say, because I live, you shall, you shall also live. To me, the idea of what living actually meant was what I needed to come to terms with. And I found that in Christ. As I look back on it, the fact that the Lord cared enough about me in my total state of deprivation to have a person come, in, come bring a Bible into my room and then cry, finding Christ as my Savior, in hindsight, I think that was the most compelling thing. When all else failed me, I wanted life, and he offered it. Amen. Amen. So the man who brought the, the Bible, obviously, was a Gideon of unknown <laughs> name and origin, just a person just like you and I. And, uh, and the young boy was, was a well-known uh, preacher named Rock, Ravi Zacharias. Mm. So Ravi Zacharias, and that's the work of the Gideons, is... is uh, bringing Bibles to people and witnessing and sharing with people who, who are lost and need Christ. And sometimes they, they turn out to be uh, uh, very famous and very crucial elements in God's uh, kingdom. So uh, the work of the Gideon ministry, we're, we're a, uh, an association of Christian business uh, and professional men and women. Uh, we were founded more than 100 years ago, and uh, we have a singular goal, one goal. It's a very simple ministry. Uh, our singular goal is to lead men and women, boys and girls, to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. That's it. We come from all different denominations, Christian denominations, so we gather together for that purpose. And what we're probably best known for is, is putting uh, Bibles in, uh, in hotels and motels. So if you've ever been into a hotel, seen a Gideon Bible, that's a very small part of our ministry. Uh, we, uh, we give out about 70% uh, of the Bibles that we, we distribute, Bibles and Testaments, are these little, little ones. Uh, 
that we give out to uh, high school and college age students. So we, we go onto college campuses, we hand these out to people and uh, to young uh, people and and so that's that's what we do so and then also not only distribution at certain places but also through personal witnessing and I'd kind of forgotten about the the girl at we were at the Russell Inn and and uh, uh, so we had an interaction with our waitress there but just recently this was when we were in Pittsfield and I'd kind of forgotten about this till I was preparing for talking about this we had a similar encounter with a waitress in uh, Pittsfield where we were out to eat uh, we were with a few other people uh, we had the, we had a waitress who was and, and best way I can describe it she was a chick she was a <laughs> you know 45 50 years old yeah what do you want uh, tough tough girl uh, what can I get you you know here's some hash I'm gonna sling it at you uh, so so after dinner I asked her uh, just you gotta ask and I said do you have a Bible Nah, I don't have a Bible uh, would you like one sure I'll take one and she was very <laughs> Yeah, I'll take one. So I, so I turn to uh, the front, and I, I usually explain this to people. I say, in the front, there's some helps. If you've never read a Bible before, this is really helpful because there's page numbers. So if you want to learn about a subject, there's page numbers. And I said, for example, if you're discouraged, there's some, some things you can find out what about God says about discouragement. And as soon as I said that, she melted. She said, you wouldn't believe what I've been going through, and this must be God speaking to me, and I'm making decisions right now uh, about whether me and my daughter are going to... It sounded like she was trying to escape from a bad relationship, and we're just, we're just deciding right now about whether we should move down to, to New Jersey, to uh, down south somewhere, I forget where it was, and... And so we asked if we could pray for her, and she, so here we are in a restaurant with this, with this woman, and, and you would never know it, the, the 15 second change. Can we pray for you? Oh yeah, could you pray for me? Amen. Well, do you want to go somewhere where we, no, let's pray right here. <laughs> so in a restaurant, Gretchen, myself, and her held hands next to our table. And we just prayed for her and the decision that she had to make. And so that's, that's the work of the Gideons, is interacting with people about the love of a God that, that loves them and cares for them. And, and how, do we, how do we, you know, in my flesh, I can judge, man, she is... <laughs> But God knows her heart and what she's going through and her needs. And, and, and so that's our job as Christians, not just as Gideons, but to, to bring the message of hope to people who, who don't have hope. So we, so we as Gideons, now, now there's about 300,000 of us in the world, all over the world. Um, we're organized in 196 countries. So when we pray, we have a, a monthly prayer calendar. When we pray... We pray for the countries that we're in, but the list of countries that we're not in is, is really very limited. We're approaching 200 countries in the world, and there's not that many more countries that we don't have a presence in. Uh, we print Bibles in, in uh, 90 languages, 90-something languages, and we give them out free of charge. So we take the Word of God and we hand them out to people free of charge. And that's, that's really the ministry. And then when we can interact with people, we, we do that. Uh, so, so the cost to one of these, we pay all the overhead of the organization. There's a small paid staff uh, in Nashville. We pay the overhead for the staff to, to organize, you know, shipping Bibles around the world. Uh, so we pay dues as Gideons. And then churches pay for the Bibles. So, so you pay for these. So praise God for that. Praise That's great. God. And who else? We can't get corporate sponsorship. If the church doesn't sponsor buying Bibles and giving them to people who are in the world, who else? 
who else right. who else should do that and nobody else is is really going to do that so so when you when you guys give to the work of the Gideons a hundred percent of what you give goes to the the printing and then the shipping of the Bibles around the world so so praise God so we go to hotels motels schools colleges prisons uh, military homeless shelters um, and we fulfill the Great Commission what we think part of the Great Commission I mean we're not the only we're not the only group that does this, but uh, to go into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature, and that's in Mark uh, 16, chapter 15. And so just for examples, and then we do work here. So, so as you have given in the, in the past to the Gideon ministry, uh, last year, just in the uh, west of the Connecticut River, uh, you know, up to Northampton, down to the border of Connecticut, we, we distributed about 5,700 copies of God's Word. And, and most of them were to uh, Holyoke Community College, Westfield State College, and Smith College. Those are the three colleges that are in our areas. Northampton High School, Holyoke High School, uh, nursing homes that are in the area. And so when you think about it, we're giving out uh, the copies of, of God's Word. So, so for example, last week or two weeks, no, last week we were at Holyoke Community College. Uh, we handed out about 700 uh, Bibles or scriptures to the students. We were at a a back to school event at a in, right next to a public school in Holyoke where we gave out about 800 Bibles to the kids that are there. We, we're not allowed in the schools anymore so we go outside the school <laughs> and the kids were getting backpacks and we were there giving out the Word of God to kids. Uh, next week September 10th we're at UMass so pray for that that's not just us in our group that's uh, people from Springfield area people from uh, up into uh, the Amherst area and so we gather together we give out about between 4,500 and 5,000 of these every year we like to do it at the beginning of the year when the freshmen are there because by the time they get to be seniors they're like nah I don't want the Bible but as they come in we, we, we give those out for over 40 years, we've on, been on the campus of U University of Massachusetts. So we have a very good relationship with, with that community. And then uh, the week after that, we're at Westfield State College. Uh, we went there in the spring last year. We're back in the, in the fall. And so does it really make a difference when you give a Bible to a college kid? Yeah. Because yeah. I, went to, I, went to, uh, I went to college with... Uh, Kathy's sister, Dolly, at Western New England College. I was a senior, college senior. You know, 185 pounds of beer guzzling fury. Uh, you know, and, uh, and a Gideon was there at the campus center and they gave me a Bible. And, uh, and so then after, my, after I graduated, um, I... <laughs> After I graduated, I actually started reading it, and for me, it was life-changing. Where, where Amen. that's how I came to Christ is is I didn't grow up in a Christian household, mm -hmm. and I came to Christ through reading the Bible a little bit at a time in my in my uh, apartment at night, hiding because I didn't want people to think I was nuts. But I <laughs> but I, I remember specifically thinking. I know the Bible's an important book and I've never read it before and I should probably read it. And that was the, the extent of my, my thought process and so I just started reading it. And, and God saved me and I didn't even know he was saving me because it just there were things that were speaking to my heart and I know now it was the Holy Spirit. Back then I just felt like, wow, that's really, that's really good. So that's, that's, uh, that's how God uh, saves us. So, so anyways, how can you help? How can you help? Pray for us. We're going. We're going to uh, at the at the end of this month. We're going to Boston. Members of the Gideons from all over the state. We have something called the Boston Blitz. Every year, we go to colleges. We go to nursing homes. We go to different things. There's a lot of colleges in Boston. People from all over the world come to Boston. Students from all over the world. We distribute the Word of God to them. We're going to give out about 30,000 scriptures in that time frame. So, so we do that every year. Pray for that. UMass, think of this, just three things. UMass, Westfield State, uh, and, then, and then Boston. And in those, with those three things, we're planning, we'll probably give out 35,000 Bibles to people who don't know. So pray for us.
become a Gideon. If you want to learn more, see me afterwards. And then, and then give, uh, you know, anything that you can give to support this. That's, that's what we do. Uh, just, and and this, this is really not, not the hard sell, but just the reality of what's going on is um, last year we, we gave out 80, 81 and a half million Bibles. You say, that's great. We gave out 81 and a half million Bibles. Um, the prior year, we gave out 84 million Bibles. Our goal for last year was like 87 or 88 or 89 million Bibles. It was something like that. It was the first year that we went backwards um, in, in giving out Bibles since World War II. So if you look at a curve of how many we've given out in the past, whatever, you know, since we've been keeping track, it was the first year that we went backwards. The only reason that we went backwards was financial, purely financial. We're a all volunteer organization. We we work on a cash basis. Money comes in, we buy Bibles, we ship them out. It's simple. People we have boots on the ground in all these countries. The people who have who are in the countries then go distribute Bibles. Um, the big the big thing was India. India was screaming for Bibles. I, we ship more Bibles to India than any other country in, in the world. Um, so we, they were screaming for Bibles. We need more Bibles. We didn't have the Bibles to ship to them. And it's, it's a little bit of the same situation this year. Um, a, a, almost a billion people in, 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 in India. So out of those 80 million, I think more than 10 million, but not much more than 10 million went to India. It's still a very small percentage of the overall population that we're reaching. Think about what's going to happen when China opens up. A billion people, we're not going to have the cash to, to do that. We, we, just, it's, 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 we have the people in place to do that. We just don't have the, the finances to do that. Uh, we do have... We do have an organizational structure in China already. We're just not free to distribute. Uh, we've, we've come to a, an arrangement with the Chinese government where we can distribute in churches. So we can go into churches in China and give out copies of God's Word. And we, we give out quite a few in China already. Uh, and if you think about it, people in China don't have Bibles. They're in churches, they get saved, they don't have a Bible. So, so we do that in China. So uh, at some point, China's going to open up. It's the biggest country in the world, God's going to open that door. His word says he's going to do it. So, so, so when you give to the Gideons, you're giving to not only people here in this organization, a college student like, like me. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, that's all I can say is, is I don't know how God works so I just, in my humanity, I have to say thank you because I don't know if I'd be saved if, if somebody hadn't given a buck twenty-five to give a Bible to a, a, a college student in 1984 at Western New England who actually sat down and read it. So, so thank you for, for, for doing that. And then nursing home residents and then around the world, somebody in a far-flung country that, that really doesn't have what we have from a Christian background uh, and so, so thank you for, for doing that. So, so praise God. So I'm gonna I'm gonna transition now uh, to to just uh, maybe breaking more of the Word of God and uh, and just speaking some of the things that that the Lord laid on my heart. Uh, my wife and I have a little bit of a joke that I'll share with you now. Um, we we had a guy that came to our church once, and he he started preaching, and he and he did and he did his one point, and and then he said, "I only have 19 more." So and everybody kind of chuckled, and he said, "No, really, I, I have another 19 <laughs> points." And so so and he did, and so so uh, I really only have one point. So so it's not even three points in a, a summary or whatever they they usually have. I have I have one point uh, that I that I just like to. To just uh, break the word of God with, and and talk. Um, is it is that clock accurate? Twelve. Yes. It is. What, about what time do you do you normally? Whenever. 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 Okay, praise God, praise God. I don't I don't want to I don't want to nail your foot to the ground and, and keep you here forever. So, so I was 
So I was reading, and I didn't know where this came from, but have you ever heard, you know, what is the chief end of man? I found out this was from the, something called the Westminster Shorter Catechism. There's a question, what is the chief end of man? And the answer is, man's chief end is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. And I just think that's so cool. That's just such a great summary. And so I went online and Googled it because I didn't know where that came from. But it came from like the Scotland, Church of Scotland approved this for, for the, the catechism. Anyway, so that's, but that's such a great summary of, of uh, you know, what are, what God, the chief end of, man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. People don't, en you know, people don't enjoy life a lot of times, and people don't enjoy God. You know, God is like the slave master, and he's not. He is a savior that loves us, and our chief end is to, is to glorify him and to enjoy him forever. So, uh, uh, and, and Th this isn't something that's meant to be to be pushed into the next life either. It's not something that that someday I will glorify Him and enjoy Him forever. It's something for now. So I just like to talk a, a little bit about that. Um, and let's let's just go a, a little bit to, to Genesis chapter three. Genesis is a book of uh, seed truths where a lot of the things in the book of Genesis then are, that's what God desired. That was God's desired state, and then things got off track. And God has been working for many years now, uh, in our human terms, to, to try and put things back into place. And so, so uh, and some of this is by faith, and most of it's by the work of God. And so, um, in Genesis chapter three, I'm going to skip over some of the, some of the other stuff. But Genesis chapter three, and in verse uh, right at the beginning of that, where the serpent comes, he he tempts a man, and and in verse six it says, and when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, God said, "Don't eat of this." You can eat of that. You can eat of everything else. Don't eat of this. And so, so uh, you know, there was the tree of life in the garden. And then there was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And God said, if you eat of this one, you're going to die. So if I could contrast, there's the tree of life and there's the tree of death. That's what it really was. So, so to make it more black and white, God said, you, you, there's the tree of life, tree of death. Don't eat of the tree of death. And, and, and what does man do? Eat from the tree of death. Eats from the tree of death. And, and, so, so, and that's the root of all our problem is that we, we as humans, because of the sin nature, now because of the sin nature that we've been passed on, we, we tend to, in our, in our humanness, Kind of wander over to the tree of death. We become independent from God, and and we want to make our own decisions about what's right and wrong. And so we tend to kind of kind of go toward that way of things. So so when the woman saw the tree, it was good for food, it was pleasant to the eyes, and the tree was desired to make one wise. She took of the fruit thereof and did eat, and gave also to her husband with her, and he ate. Verse seven. And the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. And they heard the voice of God walking in the garden. They heard the voice of God. In the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid from them, themselves from the presence of the Lord among the trees of the garden. And the Bible says, who can hide from God? You can't hide from God. You know, God is here. He's right over there. And he's here. And he's here, and he's back there, and he's over there. And so God, and when you leave here, he's everywhere. The Word of God says, I think it was Solomon who said, the temple can't contain you, the heavens of the heavens can't even contain you. And he, he is everywhere. And so we, in our humanity, have this, have this uh, view sometimes that we can, we can hide from God. And you can't hide from God because he's, he knows everything. 
just think about this. And sometimes we don't think about things. He knows everything. He sees everything. He's everywhere. This is his universe. And, and we, we can't hide from him. So Adam and Eve tried to do that, and that didn't work. And so, so, so here we have a uh, situation where they did this. I just want to read a little bit from a, from a book, if I could, uh, to just... Uh, so, so man fell, and then God started to inter... You know, God starts to interact, to draw man back. And one of the things that he did was he had uh, the people of Israel build a temple. First of all, he had them build a, a, a tent, a tabernacle. He had them build a temple. And in the temple, that's where they could go, as Solomon said, this temple can't contain you. But that's where man would go to meet with God. And so... so, so this is, this is really good. This is from a book called uh, The Pursuit of God, I think. But it says, The interior journey of the soul from the wilds of sin to the enjoyed presence of God is beautifully illustrated in the Old Testament tabernacle. The returning sinner, this was somebody returning from their sin, first entered the outer court where he offered a blood sacrifice on the brazen altar. So first of all, the blood sacrifice is offered. Which is, which is indicative of, of Christ shedding his blood, which we just celebrated communion. Washed himself in a laver that stood near it. So then he washed himself clean. Then through a veil he passed into the holy place where no natural light could come. But the golden candlestick, which spoke of Jesus, the light of the world, the world threw its soft glow all over it. There was also the showbread that tells of Jesus, the bread of life, and the, the altar of incense, a figure of unceasing prayer. I'm getting to a point. I'm just reading this. So we'll, we'll get there. Though the worshiper had enjoyed so much already, still he had yet to enter into the presence of God. So, so this, if you read in the temple, there's, it's, 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 it's a tough read to read about it because it's like details upon details, but, but this guy has boiled it down pretty good. He enters into the presence of God, another veil separated from the Holy, Holy of Holies where the mercy seat dwelt and very good on himself in his awful and glorious manifestation. While the tabernacle stood, only the high priest, so once a year the high priest could go into this place and meet with God. With the blood he offered for sins and the sins of people, it was the last veil which was rent when our Lord gave up the ghost on Calvary. And the sacred writer explains that the rending of this veil opened the way for every worshiper in the world to come into the new and living way, straight into divine presence. So, so one of the things that happened when Christ shed his blood on the cross, there's this, just this little scripture that says, and the veil was rent. Mm -hmm. That veil was, how do you enter into, it was this miraculous thing that, that sometimes we lose sight of. When Christ died on the cross, this veil was rent, opening the way for all of us every one of us to enter into that the presence of God Amen. so yeah praise God and um, so the question is why don't we that that way has been made and you say well why what hinders us from entering into that place to commune with God who, is, who has done so much to invite us in. So, to me, so turn to Matthew chapter 7. Let me see if I could emphasize the opposite of this. Matthew chapter 7. In Matthew chapter 7, And I guess starting in, let's start in verse 21. It says, Not everyone that says unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that does the will of my Father which is in heaven. 
many will say unto me that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? And in your name have cast out devils, and in your name have done many wonderful works. And then I will profess to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you that work iniquity. If I could, if I could put this into human terms, and this was a challenge that God had challenged me with maybe 20 years ago, saying, what is it in your life that would cause me to say to you, I never knew you? Now, now picture this. You're sitting down with God. You've got a cup of coffee in front of you. You're at a table. You and God. That's it. Nobody else. It's just the two of you. You've lived life. You died. You go to be in the presence of God. And God says to you, Do we know each other? Uh, do, do I know you? Do I really... Have we ever talked before? Have we ever... Have we ever communicated? Do I? I don't think so. I don't think I know you. Um, and and you got to put it in real terms. That and and and, I, and I'm not just talking about you know the judgment, but it's the joy that we have now that we're able to have now of that communion with God uh, every day. And so, so the, the, the one question I have is, have you spent time with Him today? Amen. Have you been in your prayer closet with God today? Have you been in your prayer closet with God yesterday? Have you spent the time? There is... Uh, so, so, so I've been Christian now for 30 years. Um, and really it's been, so I, you know, maybe the last two, three years that I've really gotten this more of a depth of this where, where as a good Christian, when I was first saved, it was more performance. Oh God, I did this, I did that, you know, look at this. God, can you give me this? I'm going to pray. And, and, and just the depth of, of my relationship has gotten deeper over the past so many years with, with God where, it's a daily walk. It's a daily communion. Amen. It's a daily... We're talking. We're talking. You know what I mean. It's that... It's that... It's that... I desire... Where's my desire? Where's my heart? And, and the ills of sin and the ills of pride and, you know... Somebody says something wrong about you, and 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 your pride rises up, and and oh, it wounded me, and and all the, you know all the things you go through as a human. Someone says something bad about you, and as you spend time with God, you say, "Oh God, we were just talking about that yesterday. You're right. We were just talking about how how little I really am on the face of the earth, and how great you are." And, and the person who said that about me was right. I really am pretty small stuff. Because we were just discussing that. And, and that communion with God that you have, you're, you're just talking and communing with Him. And so, so that's my question is, uh, is your relationship with God something in the future? Is it this foggy future relationship? Or is it something that is a current reality today. And God doesn't have any favorites in his, in his household. It's not like he loves one more than the other. Amen. He has made the way already. The veil has been rent. It's there. When we talk about nearness to each other, I could be standing next to my wife and not be near in my heart with her. You know, we have physical nearness. God is already here. He's already made the way for us to enter in. And that nearness is, do you spend time with Him? Just you and Him. I know you come to church. I know you might go to a Bible study. But there is, there is, there is nothing that replaces you one-on-one -on -one spending time with Him. So have you?
You answer that yourself. And if you haven't, I'd like to not only challenge you because it's, it's the right thing to do, because you don't want to get to the point where you sit across from him someday and he says, do, do we know each other? You know, I gave you the opportunity and you just never took me up on it. That's the, that's the judgment, but then there's also the, the joy of life where when you spend time with God and you understand who he is and what he's talking to you and he speaks to you, and it's not some, there's no magic to this. This is not a difficult thing. Spend time with him. He wants to know you. He wants to be known to you. He wants to have a relationship. He's already, he's already done, he's already made the way. When we accept Christ as our Savior, when he died on the cross, that's the beginning. His real desire is for you to enter a relationship to him. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to close with just one, one scripture. Go to Luke chapter 24. Luke 24. You can sit in a church for a long time and still not feel like you have a experiential relationship. Experiential being, I experience that with God. And so I'd, I'd like to invite you and God me, I'm just talking. Uh, God wants to, he's already, the invitation's there. He's at the door of your heart. He's knocking. Amen. He wants to enter. Here, this is a great scripture to close with. Uh, Luke 24. And so Jesus dies. He rises again. And these two guys are walking on the road to Emmaus. And, uh, and so uh, uh, and Jesus joins them. Let me see where I can start. 13. Thirteen, yeah. And behold, the two of them were that same day on a village, uh, to a village called Emmaus, which was from Jerusalem about uh, three score furlongs. And they talked together all these things that had happened. Jesus died. He rose. And, and as it came to pass, while they communed together and reasoned, Jesus himself, verse 15, drew near and went with them. But they didn't know it. They didn't know it was Jesus. And so Jesus, they're walking down the road and they're talking, and, but their eyes were holding. Their eyes were, not, they, they couldn't see that they couldn't know him. And when he said to them, hey, what's been going on? What are the, you know, hey, what's up? What are you guys talking to? What are you, why are you sad? What's going on? You know, what, what's going on? And one of them says, hey, hey, aren't you, you're a stranger here? Don't you know the things which came to pass? And they said to him, what, and Jesus said, what things? <laughs> of course, you know, he was playing, he was playing. The, but the great, this is my favorite scripture in this. Goes down, they're going, and, and, and so uh, Jesus is explaining to them. Verse 28, and as they drew near the village where they went, he made as though he would have gone further. So Jesus and them are walking, and they say, this is the off-ramp for us. We're going into town to get a place to, a bite to eat and a place to lay our head. And Jesus says, I'm just going to keep going to the next town. You catch that? I'm going to just... And... But they constrained him, saying, Abide with us. For it's toward evening, the day is far spent. And I don't understand this, but God wants us to desire to be with him. He, they were like, no, stay with us. We want you. And it wasn't until then that he re revealed himself to them. That finally they sat down to eat. He broke bread. And then he revealed himself to them. So I would like to challenge you, not because uh, it's... Because I, I just want you to, to enjoy your relationship. I want you to have a full relationship with God. And I want you to enjoy your relationship with God. So I would challenge you, tomorrow, spend time with God. It doesn't have to be... It's not out of a script. It's not out of a... 
a book. It's not out of a devotional guide. It's not anything like that. So you take time and say, God, maybe I haven't been spending enough time with you. I don't even know where to start. I don't know. I just feel like we're, 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 we don't know each other well enough. And commune with me. God will lead you. He's God. He wants, that's what he wants. He just wants you to desire to spend time with you. He'll lead the dance. You just take the first step. That's all. Oh, we're going to go this way instead of that way. And, and so I would challenge you to, to do that. If you're not doing that already, or if, you've la if you used to do it, but now you're not, uh, do that. Spend time. Get up a half an hour earlier. Spend time with them. Salvation is just the first step. You know, witnessing to others is an important offshoot that we have to do because we got something great. But the most important thing that you can do as a believer, the most important thing, is for you to spend time with God. Just think about it. You and your wife. You want to get closer to each other? You're this far apart? Get closer to God individually and you will get closer together. How's that for, how's that for geometry? <laughs> you know? <laughs> you go toward the center of the triangle, the isosceles triangle or whatever it is, you'll get closer to each other. Amen. It's simple. It really, and it works. It works. It really does. And that's, you know, you get closer to God, He'll, he'll bless your life. So, so I don't know. Do you want to close? Okay. So praise God. If you're a listener who doesn't know Jesus Christ, if you're, if you're not born again of God's Spirit, today's the day of salvation. Jesus could come back right now, and if he were to come back right now, and if you're not saved, you're going to get left behind, and you're going to have to meet the most horrible person this world has ever seen, the Antichrist. We at First Congregational Church don't want that to happen to you. And so we ask you, come to Jesus, accept him into your heart. And if you would just pray this real simple prayer with me, you can punch your ticket for the rapture on Airline Jesus. So just pray with me. Dear Jesus, I believe that I am a sinner. I believe that you are the Son of God. I ask you to forgive me for my sins, to cleanse me from my iniquities. Come into my life. Be my Lord. Be my God. Be my Savior. I surrender to you. I ask that you would do this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you did that for the first time, happy birthday. Today truly was your day of salvation. One, one last favor I ask of you. If you could just go and tell a Bible preaching pastor or friend, someone you trust, what you did. Tell them how you accepted Christ into your heart. Because there's something about speaking out what we do that builds up our faith in Jesus. Well, from, from the rest of us at First Congregational Church, we'll see you next week, and may God bless you all the days of your life.